it's Miss Sinclair for AP World History. Today we are continuing our lectures from Unit 7. We have finished up talking about World War I and we are returning to Russia today to talk about Joseph Stalin. Remember any of the videos that are shown or rather referenced in these lectures are available on the YouTube playlist. So check them out, they are added resources. There's often more videos there than are available to show in class anyway. Please take notes as you go and if you have questions, don't be afraid to ask. So for your bell work for today, I would recommend that you pause and you think about what is the mandate system? Can you remember what it is? It's really easy, I've said this before, to think, yep, I know everything when you've just heard it or you've just written it down. That means you can recognize the correct information, but do you actually know it? So a day later, two days later, can you describe the mandate system? Today, we are talking about Joseph Stalin. So he's a big guy. He's kind of important. So we are continuing to look at our AP World History Objective 7.4, 7.5, about how governments responded to like economic crises. So your objective, you'll be able to identify and explain the consequences of Stalin's rule from the Soviet Union in terms of economics, politics, and social. So the Stalin revolution. So where'd we leave off in Russia? Well, we left off with Lenin having a stroke and dying and there's a power struggle, and Stalin is our new leader. So Joseph Stalin is a Bolshevik revolutionary, the head of the Soviet Communist Party after 1924, and the dictator of the Soviet Union from 1928 to 1953. He was born poor in the modern day country of Georgia, right? That was still part of the Russian Empire. He is going to rule the Soviet Union with an iron fist, using his five-year plans to increase industrial production and the use of terror to crush all opposition. He represented a staunch anti-Western um, Russian tradition and communism. He abandoned the original Leninist desire to create an international community of communists. He believed that communism will really only work in Russia under a dictatorship. He is sexually promiscuous. He is hardworking and a skillful administrator. Here's the thing about Stalin. He's not dumb. He is willing to work hard and he is a like, megalomaniac in my personal opinion, right? He's not necessarily a true believer in communism, I think, as much of a true believer in power. I think in a different time and place, if he was born in a capitalist society where that road would lead him to power, he would have taken that road. He is a man who desires power and control, and he will develop a cult of personality. He's going to be known as beloved, right? He is the good father of the Russian people. The use of mass media, propaganda, and spectacle will create this image of Stalin as the all-knowing leader of Russia. And so it's one of those things where it's hard to tell, did everyone really love Stalin so much or are they all too scared to say anything but that? And really, at the end of the day, is there a difference between worshiping someone and being too scared to speak out against them? So he really wanted to make Russia a fully industrial society under the control of the state. The goal of industrialization was to increase the power of the Communist Party domestically in the Soviet Union in relation to other countries. He wanted to prevent another humiliating defeat like what happened in World War I. He used terror tactics and labor camps and, frankly, is super successful. So this is a really good video on Stalin. There's a bunch of good biographies, um, videos on Stalin. 
definitely recommend you watch it. It'll help give you a more fully informed vision of him. Okay, so his big economic policy is known as the five-year plan. So war communism, out the window. New economic plan, forget it. Now it's all about the five-year plan. The five-year plan is Stalin's view for economic growth. So it's his plan to industrialize the Soviet Union rapidly, beginning in 1928. He set the goals for the output of steel, electricity, machinery, and most other products. The government will construct massive factories for mining, electrical power, and metallurgy. So you can just look and see how much goods are going to increase. So the number of state farms in 1928 compared to 1937, the average number of state workers, right? Tractors, sowing areas. So they are going to, over time, dramatically increase everything. Food production, industry, metal, electricity. I mean, there's a reason why the Cold War happens. It's not because the Soviet Union is still backwards Russia. Right? He's very successful in this. He's going to have to create whole industries and cities from scratch. Right? It's not like the infrastructure is in place. He's going to train millions of peasants to work in these new factories, mines, and offices. Remember, everyone's basically used to being a serf. So this is going to be a huge amount of change. Right? The output of machinery and metal products will grow 14-fold, which is insane. He is going to have to force the movement of people out of the rural territories into cities, teach them how to read, how to be engineers, how to live in his new industrial vision for Russia. So this is a ton of change. This is also his method for trying to force a non-capitalist system. All of this change is fully enforced by the police powers of the state. And like I said, it is very successful. It will make the Soviet Union a major industrial power before World War II. Look at those years, 1927 to 1937. What else is happening with the global economy in those years? You should have answered the Great Depression, right? While the rest of the world is like eating its own money because they can't produce food, right? You have the Dust Bowl in the United States. The rest of the global economy is in pieces. It is failing and the Soviet Union is booming, right? It's going to make communism appealing for many people. Like it seems to be working. Everyone seems to be happy and their economy is working and capitalism is not. So there's obviously a huge environmental impact to all of this. The hydroelectric dams changes the flows of river, rivers, roads, railroads, and canals are built. Forests and grasslands are turned into farmland. But all of this is through government control of the economy. So what's it like to be a lady in the Soviet Union? Well, there's pros and cons to communists and feminism. On one hand, right, feminism wants equality between men and women. Communism just wants equality between everyone at all times in all aspects of life. So in every communist state, we will see that women will get full, equal, legal, and political rights as soon as communist becomes the law, uh, communism becomes the law of the land, right? It's going to pioneer forms of li women's liberation. It's going to be very state-directed as opposed to grassroots movements. So this means women will be able to participate in government in every way a man can. It turns marriage into a civil procedure, right, rather than a religious one. Remember, communism is anti-religion, so that's not an issue anymore. Divorce will be made easier as well because, again, no religion. So if you're not happy in your marriage, just get divorced. Abortion will be easier to access as well. Women didn't have to take the surnames of their husbands. There were no more illegitimate children. So if you're born out of wedlock, who cares? You will have maternity leave given to women. And women will be actively employed in industry and level all levels of education. 
Here's the downside. Because if all of that sounded great to you as a lady, as opposed to, I don't know, like super Russian patriarchy, um, here's a downside. Because it was state-directed instead of grassroots organizations, it means that people's actual behavior and like attitudes didn't change, right? The government said, this is what we're doing now, but the way people actually behaved hadn't really changed. So there's no actual discussion of women's issues. It's still super patriarchal. It's men saying, oh, this is what the women need. Let me tell, like fix that for them. Instead of actually having women in roles of leadership, advocating for what they need and want. And since culturally Russia is still super patriarchal, women are expected to work full time, pull their weight just like a man would, but also carry the full load of house stuff, cleaning, cooking, raising the children. So if you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of work. Yeah, it is. They're expected to do twice the amount of work as men do. So Pros and cons. On one hand, you have full equal rights. And for some women, this is going to really improve their quality of life. But for other women, it's just going to increase the workload already on their shoulders. So if you're industrializing the country a lot, that means you're taking people away from their subsistence farms. That means that you need larger farms to produce the same amount of food. So what we see in communist states is something called the collectivization of agriculture. It's when you combine private farms into vast collectives and you make the farmers work together on commonly owned fields, right? So the idea here is that you combine your land together, you work it all together and you share. Again, communism is inherently optimistic. It believes that people will sacrifice their personal comfort and needs for the greater good, not once, but every time. So the idea here is that you will grow your food. You will supply the government with a fixed amount of food, which it will distribute to people in the cities. And what's left, you will share amongst your neighbors. They were to be outdoor factories where food was manufactured through techniques of mass production and the use of factories. Sorry, the use of machinery. Here's the issue. The peasants don't want to do it. Right? Think about your average peasant. They had been a serf on that land for hundreds of years, and it was only in the 19th century that they actually became um, independent. And then it really wasn't only, it was only in it wasn't until 1917 in the revolution that they actually owned the land, right? So they haven't actually been landowners that long. And now the government's stepping in again and saying, no, 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 you don't get to own your land. We're going to own your land and you're going to work it. If that doesn't sound like serfdom, I don't know what does. So the kulaks, wealthy peasants, predominantly found in Ukraine, are going to say, no, we're not doing it. We are going to keep our land. The fact of the matter is peasants have been working together on the land for centuries. They don't need the government to tell them to share. And now the government-controlled farms will be run by a government loyalist from the city outside of their community. And it sounds just like serfdom, right? A rich guy from the big city is making all the decisions while you do the hard work, please. So they say, we're not giving up your land. We're not giving up our food. Soldiers arrive at gunpoint to force them. The Kulaks say, you want it, you can have it. They burn it all. They destroy their equipment. They slaughter their livestock. In a few months, they slaughtered half of the Soviet Union's horses and cattle and two-thirds of sheep and goats. So the Kulaks officially were like wealthy peasants, but in fact, anyone who resisted the collectivization of agriculture was called a kulak. So in retaliation, Stalin orders the liquidation of the kulaks as a class. He's inciting poor peasants to attack their wealthier neighbors. So over 8 million kulaks will be arrested. Many will be executed. The rest will be sent to the gulag, these slave labor camps in Siberia, where they'll primarily starve to death. 
So this is going to lead to a famine, as you might expect. Known as the Holodomor, the terror famine, the famine genocide in Ukraine, the Great Famine, it has multiple names. It is a man-made famine that's going to stretch between 1932 and 1933. The government's going to step in and confiscate all the food. They will refuse any aid to be sent to the starving peasants, right? Neighboring countries are like, oh, you're starving? Let's give you some food. And Russia's government's like, no food allowed. They will restrict the movement of these peasants. You're not allowed to leave Ukraine, right? You have to stay there and starve. 10 million will die. It is a purge in many ways, right? Whether or not it's a genocide is something that's very debated. Um, but people will argue that this was an attempt of Stalin to kill off the ethnic Ukrainians. It is going to be devastating. So in this image, you can see that the dead bodies in the background who have starved to death. So you don't need to write this next quote down, but I want to read it. It's from a book um, on Russian history. I can't remember what the title is. I'm sorry at the moment. Survival was a moral as well as a physical struggle. A woman doctor wrote to her friend in June 1933 saying that she had not yet become a cannibal, but was not sure that I shall not be one by the time my letter reaches you. The good people died first. Those who refused to steal or prostitute themselves died. Those who gave food to others died. Those who refused to eat corpses died. Those who refused to eat their fellow man died. Parents who resisted cannibalism died before their children did. Look at that picture. What are they selling? What are they selling? Right? This was the desperate situation that Stalin put them in. And this is not unknown to him. Right? He knows exactly what's happening in Ukraine. And he approves of it, right? This is his way of forcing them into compliance. You all know why um, Stalin was such a successful leader. You know, want to know how he was able to industrialize Russia so quickly? Because he did it by force and violence and terror. And he didn't care that he killed millions. You name the mass murderers of the 20th century, of world history. Maybe you say Genghis Khan. Maybe you say Hitler. Maybe... You talk about Pol Pot or the Rwandan genocide. Most of the time, Stalin isn't first on the list because he wasn't defeated. He successfully ruled the Soviet Union for his entire life and killed millions. So, the peasants who were left were the least successful farmers, right? After you kill off all the competent kulaks, all you're left with are the bad farmers. And they continue to be incompetent. The government takes all the food and you have these famines. When you are starving to death, after your body's consumed all the fat, it starts to consume the muscles. So if you've ever noticed with images of starving children, how it looks like they always have big bellies, that's because their body has started to consume their abdominal muscles. And so there's nothing to hold their organs back from pressing against their skin. These are all images from the famine. What are they selling? There's a great video from History Channel about um, Stalin, it's famine. This is known as a man-made famine because it could have been prevented, right? The government specifically took all the food and refused to allow for aid or refugees. They specifically starved out Ukraine. And this is just the start of the terror, of the great purges. So tens of thousands of prominent communists, all of Lenin's top associates, and millions of ordinary people will be enveloped in these purges. How do you make all these changes possible? The movement of people, the collectivization of agriculture, the change of your entire economy and culture, you do it through force through terrorism. So close to a million people will be executed between 
1936 and 1941. Five million will be sent to the gulag. The terror will consume tons of energy. Here's the thing that I find really interesting is think about all of the effort necessary for the government to do anything. Like think about the census, right? The census is supposed to happen this year. Think about all the government agencies, people, advertising, how many people are involved with just trying to count the population of the United States. Think about how many people, how much energy, bureaucratic energy was involved in these purges, right? Huge numbers of officials, investigators, interrogators, informers, guards, executioners were involved in enforcing these purges. And often they would later be swept up in purges themselves. So to prevent resistance or rebellion, Stalin's secret police, known as the NKVD, which will later become the KGB, will create a climate of suspicion or in fear. In the 1930s, millions of engineers and communist parties will be arrested on trumped up charges of counter-revolutionary ideas and sabotage. He will have, Stalin will have one of his associates assassinated and bl then blame others for the crime. So we will often see that people will admit to these crimes. They'll admit to treason and revolutionary ideas. And the question is why, why would you admit to treason? Why would you admit to trumped up charges? Well, because you're being tortured physically, psychologically, and your family's being threatened. Yeah, just admit the charge. You're going to die anyway. This might save your family and you'll die sooner. Everyone's terrified because no one can be the perfect communist citizen Stalin demands. Millions will be sentenced without trials. Millions will be sent to the labor camps, the gulags, where there's never enough food, never enough housing, there's poor hygiene, no health care, and harsh physical labor. Most of the roads in Siberia were built in the gulags. So why? what might get you arrested? Well, counter-revolutionary ideas, whatever that means, sabotage, treason, suspicion, doubt, not working hard enough, working too hard because you knew someone who got arrested, and just because. Jealous neighbor, coworker, someone's annoyed with you. It turns a sullen and resentful people into a docile and hardworking, obedient subjects. Take a moment to look at this political cartoon. What's the message of it? Who do you think produced it? Looking at every aspect of it, what is saying it? What's the message here? So here's a great video from History Matters on the purges. I recommend you watch it. So. In conclusion, we had fewer people, lots of people died. You had more industries and more cities. That means job openings. So jobs were available for women, for the poor, for the young. If you were silent, if you were obedient, you could really move up through the system and there was a lot of rewards. Your life could get really good. You actually saw increased life capacity in cities. You saw it better living conditions, better nutrition and medical care in cities. So if you are obedient and turn a blind eye to all of the terrible things the government is doing, your life is a lot better under Stalin than it was under the czars. But at what cost? The brutal methods industrialized the Soviet Union faster than any other country had done before. Stalin's not dumb and he is effective even if he is immoral and evil. So how did the Soviet Union change under Stalin and at what cost? And let's look at a practice question. So pause. Can you answer this? All right. Let's look at a practice test question. Take a moment. Look at the image. Read the information. Right? Raise the flag to Lenin. It gives us victory. The banners at the bottom say, long live the party of Lenin. Long live the great guide of the international proletarian revolution, Stalin. So pause this and um, read through the question and decide, can I answer it? What do I think the answer is?
the ideology reflected in the poster is most like most directly the result of which of the following developments in the 19th century. So pause the video, write down your answer. I'm going to go through two more questions before I give you the answers. Which of the following directly enabled the establishment of the government that produced the poster? Which of the following best describes the likely intent of the poster? Okay, do you have your answers? All right, the answer to number one is going to be A, obviously. So discontent with traditional forms of government like absolutism will lead to the development of new ideas. So why is it not B, C, or D? Rebellions against imperial rule lead to the formation of newly independent states. First of all, no colonies. Second of all, no new independent states. Third of all, it has nothing to do with the poster. Demands of expanded suffrage included women and the working class. These are liberal ideas, not communist ideas. Again, not connected to the posters. Enlightenment philosophy, nothing here about enlightenment. Okay, number two, the answer is going to be A, the collapse of the Russian Empire under the stress of World War I. So which enabled the establishment of the poster? Well, the Soviet Union came into being before the peace treaties ending World War I. The abolition of serfdom happened a lot earlier than the Soviet Union. And imperial expansion and ethnic violence has nothing to do with the communist government. Finally, number three, which of the following best describes the likely intent of the poster? It's going to be B, to support centrally directed economic programs, right? So Soviet is nothing about the League of Nations in that poster. Um, Soviets aren't free market, right? They're not, they're communist, not capitalist. And it's support for the government, not resistance to it. So B. Good. All right, so for your summary for today, I want you to identify and explain a consequence from Stalin's rule of the Soviet Union. So identify and explain an economic consequence of Stalin. Identify and explain a political consequence of Stalin, and identify and explain a social consequence of Stalin. Thanks, guys. As always, please remember there are more videos available for you in our Unit 7 YouTube playlist. If you have questions, please ask, and I hope you found this helpful.